Well, good morning, everyone. I trust that you had a good night's rest and you're ready for another long, productive day. Today we're going to begin our study with uh, lesson number five. And all of these lessons that we studied yesterday are preparatory to the study of Habakkuk, which we'll get to this afternoon. This lesson that we're going to look at now is going to take us probably two sessions, or at least almost two sessions this morning. Uh, we begin on page 65 of our study notes, and uh, this is a rather long lesson. I think it has 14 or 15 pages, um, which makes it very difficult to cover in one class. I want to cover it well uh, because uh, it's foundational for uh, the book of Habakkuk. We're going to study about Babylon's infuriating wine. And when we get to Habakkuk, we're going to find several verses that refer to wine. And uh, really, the book of Habakkuk is dealing with uh, the context of Babylon coming against Jerusalem. So it's within the same historical context. So that's why we're dedicating time to this particular uh, lesson today. Some of the things that we have in this lesson I've covered in previous uh, lectures uh, but uh, this one has additional material and maybe a different way of focusing on the material. So we want to have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our study. Father in heaven, thank you for raising up this day your people with life. We thank you for the privilege of being here and in freedom, opening your word and studying it. We know that the time is coming when we will not have that privilege. So help us, Lord, to appreciate it now and to take advantage while the door is still open. Be with us as we study about Babylon's infuriating wine. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we begin, as I mentioned before, on page 65 of our study notes. The terminology of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, which is the three angels' message, indicates that the three angels' messages are sequential. In other words, they go in order. Notice, for example, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Then, in verse 8, it says, And another angel followed. Are they in order? Yes. yes. And then in verse 9, then a third angel followed them. So the three angels' messages are in chronological order. One leads to the next. That's a very important point as we study along. Thus, the second angel's message is connected with the first. In fact, we're going to notice that the reason why Babylon falls in the second angel's message is because Babylon rejected the first. And the third angel is going to say, if you did not accept the first angel's message, if you didn't get out of Babylon, then you're going to receive the mark of the beast and the wrath of God. So they are sequential. They're connected one with the other. So let's read Revelation 14, verse 8, which is the second angel's message. A little later on, we're going to look at the connection with the first angel's message. It says, and another angel followed, saying, followed the first one. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, and now comes the reason, because, why did she fall? Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So there's several concepts here. Babylon is fallen because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, before we can understand the fall of Babylon, we first of all need to understand what Babylon is. <laughs> In Revelation, Babylon has a broad meaning and it has a narrow meaning. So Babylon has a, has a larger meaning, a larger context, and it also has a more restricted context. First, we need to understand that in Revelation that 
Babylon is not the literal city of the Old Testament. It's not that city in literal Mesopotamia, where Iraq is today. That Babylon no longer exists. It ceased long ago. So the evidence indicates in Revelation that Babylon is a symbolic city. It is not a literal city. It is a spiritual global city. Because Babylon sits on multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. It is a global system. It is not a literal city. And this Babylon, this end time Babylon, which is spiritual and global, is going to eventually oppose God's people, the last remnant of time. Now let's take a look at the broad meaning of Babylon. In the broadest sense, Babylon is composed of a threefold confederacy of powers that will rule, according to Revelation, the world with an iron fist at the end of time. What are the three members of this coalition that is called Babylon? Revelation 16 and verse 13 and 14, and then verse 19 explains that this Babylon has three confederate powers that join together. Let's read those verses. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. There's the first part of Babylon. Out of the mouth of the beast. That's the second. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. So the three divisions of Babylon are the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And notice verse 14, for they are spirits of demons, these three uh, unclean spirits like frogs. They are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world with what purpose? To gather them. So let me ask you, is there going to be a gathering, a coalition of these three powers with the multitudes of the world? Are they going to be united? Absolutely, because it says they go to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. This is uh, the battle of Armageddon, which is mentioned a little bit um, later in Revelation chapter 16. Now, up to this point, is Babylon united? Yes or no? At this point, Babylon is united. They're gathered, aren't they? It says they're gathered. But then something happens. Verse 19. Now the great city, what is the great city? Well, it's Babylon in the book of Revelation. But Rome is Babylon. And so now the great city, what happened suddenly? Was divided into three parts. What are the three parts? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet in context. So is a time coming when the threefold coalition is going to break apart and they're going to be divided? Yes. And when does this happen? At the very end. And the cities of the nations, what? Fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That is the time of the plagues and of the second coming of Christ. So the three evil spirits go out to gather the whole world in a system opposed to God's law and God's people. And then what happens? When Jesus manifests his wrath in the plagues, the threefold coalition falls apart. Now, can you think of another place in the Bible where the word Babylon is used and there's a united project to establish a world monarchy and then they are divided? Folks, the first time in the Bible that the word Babel, Babel is used is in Genesis 11. So must there be some relationship between Babylon in Revelation and Babel in Genesis chapter 11? You remember the story at Babel, right? 
Were they united in one project? Oh, they were. Ellen White says that they wanted to establish a universal monarchy headquartered there where they were building the tower. They were expecting to rule the world, and the project was going well. They were all together building the tower, but then what happened? Oh, God confused their languages, and the United Project became division. And Ellen White explains in Patriarchs and Prophets that when one started talking Spanish and the other one spoke French, they got angry at each other, and there was shedding of blood among them. The project was broken apart. That is the backdrop to this. Are you with me or not? Because it's the same Babel in Revelation, it's Babylon. First united in a project to establish a world monarchy, a new world order, if you please, and then God manifests His wrath and the unity is broken apart and they end up fighting each other. Now, let's continue here. We have previously encountered these three powers in Revelation 13. See, Revelation 16 is not the first place where you have the unity of these three powers. They actually come from Revelation 13. Now, in Revelation 13 there is a dragon. What does a dragon represent? Well, um, it represents Satan primarily, but it represents Satan working through the civil powers of the world. Now let's continue, let's pursue this. So in Revelation 13 you have a dragon, Satan working through the Roman Empire. In a moment we're going to give proof of that. Then this dragon, Satan through the Roman Empire, gives its seat of authority to the beast, which represents the papacy. And then the papacy receives a deadly wound, and it's convalescing for a, for a period of time, and then the false prophet arises, and the purpose of the false prophet is to restore power to the beast, the power that the beast lost because of the deadly wound. And this beast that rises from the earth, which is also called, by the way, the false prophet, is actually going to cater to the first beast and is going to restore power to it. Now notice this chart. You see, in Revelation 17, you have the th same threefold division, but the terminology is different. See, in Revelation chapter 13, you have the dragon, the beast, and the beast that, that makes an image of the beast. And then in Revelation 16, you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The false prophet is the same as the beast that rises from the earth. And then in Revelation 17, you have the same three powers, but different terminology is used. Notice the chart. In Revelation 13, you have the dragon. What would the dragon be equivalent to in Revelation 17? The kings of the earth. Second, the sea beast in Revelation 13. What would be equivalent to that in Revelation 17? The harlot. And the land beast of Revelation 13, 11 to 18, in Revelation 17 would be what? The daughters of the harlot. Are you following me or not? So in Revelation 17 you have different terminology, but you have the same threefold coalition. United for a period of time, but then later on we're going to see divided. Now somebody might object and say, Pastor Bohr, the Bible identifies Satan as the great dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil, and Satan. So how do you say that the dragon represents the kings of the earth and of the whole world? Well, let's pursue this in the several verses and quotations that I have here from the spirit of prophecy. In Ezekiel 29 and verse 3, Pharaoh is denoted by a very interesting name. <laughs> it says there in Ezekiel 29 verse 3, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the what? The great dragon that lies in the midst of his streams that says, My Nile is my own, I made it for myself. So who is the great, who, who actually was behind Pharaoh to try and keep Israel from leaving 
the land of Egypt. Satan. Who wanted Moses dead? It was Satan. But how did Satan maneuver? He used Pharaoh in order to try to slay Moses. So the dragon, the great dragon is really the devil working through a civil power. Now notice Revelation 12 verse 4. This is talking about Jesus being born. And who was waiting for Jesus when Jesus was born? The dragon. Revelation 12 says, The dragon stood next to the woman to devour her child as soon as the child was born. However, in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16, uh, it says something different. What does it say in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16? It says there, um, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Now, So who, so who is it that wanted to slay Jesus? Was it the, the, the devil or was it uh, Herod? The answer is yes. <laughs> Satan, the real dragon behind, working behind the scenes, influencing uh, Herod to slay the child. But, you know, Herod feared that he was going to lose his throne. Uh, the devil said, hey, you can't let this child live because he's going to take your throne. But the devil really is thinking, if I let this child live, I'm going to lose my throne. So the dragon is Satan working through Rome, a civil power. Ellen White understood this. In Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 39, notice this interesting statement of Ellen White. Kings and rulers and governors, are those civil powers? They're not religious powers, they're civil powers. Kings and rulers and governors have placed the brand of Antichrist upon themselves and are represented as the dragon. What is the dragon? Kings, rulers, and governors. Who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commandments of God, and who have the faith of Jesus. So Revelation 12, 17, when it says, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who is really doing it? It's Satan through kings, rulers, and governors. Let me ask you, how much power would the papacy have if it couldn't use the civil powers of the world? You know, it was Stalin who said, how many troops does the papacy have? <laughs> the papacy is a leech. It attaches itself to the civil powers. So, so the danger is the papacy working through the civil powers of the world. Notice also Great Controversy, page 54. Great Controversy, page 54. This is talking about the moment when pagan Rome passes the baton to papal Rome. In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city. And the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. And now notice, paganism, what? Paganism had given place to the papacy. And then she quotes Revelation chapter 13 verse 2. The dragon had given to the beast, what is the dragon? Paganism, right? Pagan Rome. So it says, paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given to the beast his power and his seat and great authority. Now, at the bottom of page 67, whereas Revelation 13 refers to the threefold confederation as the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast, Revelation 19, verses 19 and 20, don't miss this point, the coalition is the kings of the earth, the beast, and the false prophet. So what takes, place, uh, what takes the place of the dragon in Revelation chapter 19? The kings of the earth. 
Are you following me or not? Now, see, the devil works by stealth. <laughs> and, the, and the world is oblivious that their decisions are being actually made by the influence of Satan. And so the dragon in Revelation chapter uh, 13 is described as the kings of the earth in Revelation chapter 19 and verses 19 and 20. So the coalition is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the kings of the world united with the papacy, the beast, and apostate Protestantism, which is the false prophet or the beast that rises from the earth. Now, here's the narrow meaning of Babylon, okay? There's a, we studied the broad meaning. What is the broad meaning of Babylon? It is the threefold coalition, right? It's the banding together of the dragon, the kings of the earth, the beast, the papacy, and the false prophet or the beast from the earth. Uh, that is Babylon. It has three parts. The great city was divided into three parts. The same three parts that were united earlier in chapter 16. But Babylon also has a narrower meaning. Let's go to the top of page 68. Although the book of Revelation informs us that end time Babylon will be composed of this trilogy of powers. The evidence indicates that one of them will control and dominate the other two. Are you with me? The sea beast of Revelation 13 or the harlot of Revelation 17, like Jezebel in the story of Elijah, will be the central figure or protagonist of the story. She, the harlot, called Babylon, will pull all the strings. She'll call all the shots and orchestrate all of the events. The other two members of the confederation will merely be her puppets. So who is the dangerous figure in this story? Are the kings of the earth danger, a danger in themselves? No. Uh, is the land beast dangerous in itself? No. Who is the dangerous figure that in a restricted sense is called Babylon in Revelation chapter 17? It is the harlot, which is a symbol of what power? The papacy. Now, notice the details in Revelation 13, 1 through 10. And also we connect Daniel 7 and 8 because the little horn is the same as the beast of Revelation chapter 13. Notice how the harlot or the beast actually orchestrates all of the events and controls the other two. Number one, the dragon gave the sea beast its power, its throne, and great authority. And then the sea beast rules for how long? According to Revelation 13, 42 months. The same as 1260 days or years, the same as time, times, and the dividing of time. And then what does the sea beast do during this period? It doesn't say the kings do it. The United States, the third member of the coalition, hasn't even risen yet. <laughs> it's going to arise at the end of the uh, 17th century. What does the sea beast do? It speaks what? Blasphemies against the Most High. It persecutes the saints of the Most High. It attempts to change God's what? God's law. And it imposes the mark of the beast. Uh, also, it la launches an attack against Christ's ministration in the heavenly sanctuary. This is Daniel chapter 8. But at the end of its career, what does it receive? It receives a deadly wound. And for a period, it is inactive. Has the papacy been inactive for over 200 years now? Let me explain what papacy is, okay? People think that the deadly wound, that the deadly wound uh, was given to the Catholic Church. The deadly wound was not given to the Catholic Church. 
The deadly wound was given to the papacy. You say, what's the difference between papacy and the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church is the religious aspect of the papacy. With its religious aspect, it deceives the populace. The other part is the political part. Through that, the papacy deceives the political powers of the world. The papacy is a union of church and state. The church using the state to impose her beliefs and practices. That's papacy. Let me ask you, in 1798, when the papacy received its deadly wound, did the, did the Roman Catholic Church stop functioning? No. Did people still go and have their babies baptized? Yes. Did people still go to confession? Yes. Did people still go and receive the Eucharist? Absolutely. The Catholic Church did not cease to function. What ceased to function? The political power, the civil power, was withdrawn from the papacy. And for 200 years, the papacy has been convalescing. But what's going to happen? The deadly wound is going to be healed. So what does that mean? What is the healing of the deadly wound? It means that the papacy, again, will receive the civil power. Are you with me? This isn't complicated. Now, how is the papacy going to receive a restoration of its power? By the most unlikely of all beasts, the beast that rises from the earth, the false prophet. Have you noticed in Revelation 13, 11 to 18, that this beast that rises from the earth, everything that it does, it does to please the first beast. Notice the list that we have here. The land beast, and I'm not going to read the verses, you have them there in the study notes. The land beast will exercise all the authority of the first beast. That's what the Bible says. It will force the whole world to worship the first beast. Everything it does, it will do in the presence of the first beast. By the way, what does it mean in the presence of the first beast? Well, the NIV says on behalf of the first beast. The contemporary English version says it worked for the first beast. And the lexicons or dictionaries say at the commissioning of the first beast. So is this power that rises from the earth actually independent from the papacy? No. Ironically, this country that separated church and state, this country that guaranteed civil and religious liberty is going to withdraw the civil and religious liberty by healing the wound of the papacy and thus God's people will be persecuted. You say that can't be possible in these United States of America. If you say that, you've been asleep for the last few years. You've been in a coma the last few years. Because that is happening before our eyes, before our very eyes, and you know it. Now also, notice that it says it makes an image of the first beast. And it makes an image to the first beast. Now, to the first beast men means in honor of the first beast. And of the first beast means that it becomes a replica of the first beast. Now what characterizes the first beast? What characterizes the papacy? It joins church and state. So this beast from the earth, if it's going to make an image of the first beast, it must be that it's going to join together what? Church and state. See, this isn't complicated, folks. This is actually quite simple when you understand what Revelation is describing. Not only that, it makes an image of the first beast, and we're told that it imposes the mark of the first beast. Somehow I think that this second beast, its career is to restore the power to the first beast, to heal the wound of the first beast. And when that happens, you're going to have a united threefold coalition. You see, the harlot who is called Babylon, right now she still has the deadly wound. It was not healed in 1929, folks. 
Nobody wanted, nobody wanted anything to do with the papacy, even in 1929. The wound is healed by the beast from the earth. When it joins church and state, and that did not happen in 1929. By the way, it's not Italy that will heal the, the wound of the beast. It is the United States. And Italy was the one in 1929 that actually signed the concordat with the papacy. Are you with me or not? Now, let's take a look at the next section on page 69. As in Revelation 13, Revelation 17 describes a confederation of three powers. However, chapter 17 describes this coalition as the harlot, the daughters, and the kings of the earth. Although all three will form an alliance, the harlot will pull all the strings and orchestrate all of the activities. As stated before, the other two members of the coalition will merely be the harlot's puppets. The sea beast of Revelation 13 represents the same power as the harlot of Revelation 17. Now, we can understand this better, this confederation, where the harlot is the controlling force of her two puppets by going to the story of Elijah. Who was the dangerous figure in the days of Elijah? Was it King Ahab? Ah, oh, King Ahab was a wimp. <laughs> he had no backbone, right? Were the false prophets the main uh, danger to God's people? No, who was? Jezebel. Was she a harlot? Yes, she was. She's called a harlot in 2 Kings 9, verse 22. Not only that, she was involved in the occult because she's called a witch there in, in, in 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 2. And so who is orchestrating all of the events in the days of Elijah? It is the harlot Jezebel. You see, it tells us in the Old Testament that uh, the false prophets eat at Jezebel's table and you don't bite the hand that feeds you. And Ahab, you know, he just did basically what she wanted. She wanted Naboth's vineyard. By the way, wine is involved in all these stories. We'll see that at the end. You know, she wants Naboth's vineyard and uh, she says to King Ahab, kill Naboth so I can have the vineyard. And, and what does Ahab say? Okay, dear. Are you catching the picture? The story of Elijah will be repeated. In fact, the end time remnant is Elijah. Did Jesus, did uh, the Bible promise that God will send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord? Malachi chapter 4. Now here's the interesting part. That prophecy concerning an end time Elijah was partially fulfilled in the New Testament. Do you know who the New Testament Elijah was? John the Baptist. Three times in the New Testament, John the Baptist is identified as Elijah. Not in person, no. But he came in the spirit and power of Elijah to wake up Israel like Elijah in the Old Testament wanted to wake up Israel from their apostasy. How many enemies did John the Baptist have? <laughs> you think this is, all, this is all coincidence, right? No, this is typology. See, the Bible functions on the basis of type and anti-type. Historical, literal story, and then it becomes symbolic. Let's turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and read the story of the martyrdom of uh, the New Testament Elijah, John the Baptist. Let's begin our reading at verse 16. It says there, But when Herod heard, he said, This is John whom I beheaded. Speaking about Jesus, he says, This must be John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison. Why did he bind, him, bind uh, uh, John the Baptist in prison? Was it his idea? 
No, it says for the sake of Herodias. Who hated him? Herodias. Did uh, Ahab hate him? I mean, did uh, Herod hate him? No. He enjoyed listening to him. Let's continue reading. And bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. The king was fornicating with his brother's wife. And John the Baptist says, denounce the fornication. Is there any denounce, denunciation of fornication in the book of Revelation? Yes, there is, between the harlot and the kings of the earth. Only in Revelation, it's not talking about a literal person committing literal fornication. It's talking about the kings of the earth committing spiritual fornication with the harlot. Are you following me? Now notice verse 20. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. No danger from the king unless somebody manipulated him. Verse 21, then an opportune day, an opportune day for whom? For Herodias, that's right. An opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles. Almost sounds like Daniel 5, right? the high officers and the chief men of Galilee, and when Herodias' daughter, what do you suppose they were drinking at this party? H2O? No. <laughs> Ellen White states that they were drinking wine. Only a person who was drunk would offer half of the kingdom for a dance. Notice. Verse 22. It says, And when... Herodias' daughter, Salome, does the harlot in Revelation 17 have a daughter? Does she fornicate with the kings of the earth? Does she hate God's end time Elijah? Is she filled with the blood of the saints? Yes. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Give me a break. For a dance? Now the, the plot becomes very interesting. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? It's like, the, it's like the United States is going to say to the papers, what do you want? See, this story is, is powerful. And so it says, So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? Was the daughter the dangerous figure? No, only as she was used by her mother. Was the king the dangerous figure? No, only as the king was used by the mother. That's the picture in Revelation 17. And it says, and she said, the head of John the Baptist. Was the daughter like her mother? Like mother, like daughter. Like daughter, like mother. What would you do if, if somebody said to you, uh, bring me the head of Pastor Boar? <laughs> you say, mother, you're kidding me. At least I hope that's what you would say. <laughs> she was just like her mother. Because it says in verse 25, Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Is the king the dangerous figure? No. Are the kings of the earth going to be very sorry eventually? Yes. They will realize finally that Satan was behind their actions. Now, you see the politicians, they don't have the foggiest idea that there's a power behind them. And so we have a message for them. And it's not that we need to be Republican. 
or that we need to be Democrat. It's much deeper than that. Both parties are going to join together. Like the Sadducees and the Pharisees came together. In spite of their theological differences, they said, we need to get rid of public enemy number one, or else the nation is going to perish. Are we seeing that today? Yes. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, immediately the king sent, he had no backbone. Did, did Ahab have a backbone? See, the characters of these persons are identical to the characters of the Old Testament people and the harlot at the end. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison. And now here comes, notice this, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Isn't this a phenomenal picture? that explains what's going to happen at the end. There's nothing new under the sun, folks. History repeats itself. Do you know why history repeats itself? Because the devil doesn't change, and God doesn't change, and so history doesn't change. Because God operates by certain principles, Satan works by certain principles, so history repeats itself. So let's get back to our lesson here. Let's study about this harlot. The middle of page 69. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Is this talking about a literal harlot? Talking about a literal prostitute, one person? No. It's a system. It's a global system. Are the waters some river somewhere? No. We're dealing with symbols. What was literal in the Old Testament becomes symbolic in the New Testament. That's the principle. What was local with literal Israel in the Old Testament becomes global with spiritual Israel at the end of time. So the mark of the beast is not some tattoo that gets put on people's foreheads and the right hand. The right hand means activity, it means work. You're not going to be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark. And on the forehead, your frontal lobe is behind your forehead. It means that your mind belongs to the beast. But it's not a tattoo. Some people take this literally, say, something they're going to stamp 666 on your forehead. No, no, no. The devil isn't stupid. Who's going to follow the Antichrist if he has 666 on his forehead? <laughs> now, notice, the great harlot sits on many waters. What do the waters represent? Verse 15 says, multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. The waters are symbolic. It says, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. It's a union of what? of the harlot with the civil powers of the world. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk. This is what we're going to pursue most of the second session, if not all. So notice the characters. She's a great harlot. She sits on multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. She commits fornication with the kings of the earth. And she gives the wine of her fornication to the inhabitants of the earth. And later on we'll see that she gives it to the kings of the earth. Can people who are drunk make wise decisions? Can they grasp the difference between truth and error? No. How is she arrayed? Oh, she's presumptuous. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Interesting. Purple and scarlet. And adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. Having in her hand a golden cup. What does a golden cup have in it? Wine. Right? If she has a cup, the cup has wine. Read Jeremiah 51 verse 7. So let me ask you, is wine 
and abominations interchangeable. Don't miss this point. The wine are her abominations. So it says, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So the wine are her abominations. That's going to help us understand what the wine represents. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon, the Great. So this is the restricted view of Babylon, right? It's the harlot. But she has two associates that she controls. So Babylon, in a broader sense, are all three. In a restricted sense, she's the protagonist that pulls the strings. So it says, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Hmm. You know, I have never known a mother that doesn't have children. <laughs> but these are women harlots, aren't they? These are not male harlots, these are women harlots. They are her daughters. So we are to look for a system that at some point had daughters that are like her. Hmm. Let me ask you, what happened in the 16th century? You have the Protestant Reformation. Do you know that in Vatican Council II, I didn't have these quotations, I have them in another study notes, but the, both popes, John the 23rd and Pope Paul the VI, referred to Protestants as the separated children. We welcome the separated children because the Protestant, uh, Protestant representatives were invited to be observers of Vatican Council II, which took place from 1962 to 1965. So if she's a mother, she must have daughters, right? That are like her. The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And now notice the last characteristic. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Have you ever heard of the Inquisition? Do you think the Roman Catholic Church has had a conversion experience? And she's not going to do in the future what she did in the past? Don't think so. She has not changed. She's the same system that persecuted the saints during the 1260 years. Only at the end, it's not going to be primarily in Europe, it's going to be all over the world. And so it says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. You can just imagine John having this vision. And his eyes open wide. Wow. He didn't understand fully all of this because this is for the end time. This is for our time. So let's summarize the characteristics. A harlot woman represents what? A harlot church, right? A woman symbolically in the Bible represents a church. A pure woman, Revelation 12, represents a pure church. A harlot woman represents what? Represents an apostate church. So is this a church that professes to be a Christian church? Absolutely. That's the harlot, harlot woman. She sits on many waters. What does the act of sitting mean? It has to do with authority and rule. She rules over multitudes, nation, tongues, and peoples. She rules over the kings of the earth, and through the kings she rules the multitudes. She will carry on an adulterous affair with the political powers of the world. In this way, she will forsake her legitimate husband, who is whom? Christ. Are you catching the picture? She has a golden cup in her hand. It's full of the wine of her abominations. So the abominations are the wine. That's important for what we're going to study in our next session. She will make all nations drink her wine. What does the word make indicate? She will force 
all nations to drink her wine. And when the nations drink her wine, which we're going to identify in our next session, when the nations drink her wine, they will be filled with wrath. Because it's the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She is arrayed, notice the colors that predominate. She is arrayed in purple and scarlet. Are those the colors of the Roman Catholic Church? All you have to do, folks, is look at the funeral of John Paul II. You don't find, for example, you never find the Roman Catholic priests wearing blue. Do you know why? Because blue represents the law of God. Find that in the Old Testament. It's always purple and scarlet. So she's clothed or arrayed in purple and scarlet, the preferred colors of the Roman Catholic papacy. She is very rich, a very rich system, because she's decked with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She has daughters who came forth from her and do her bidding. She is and will be what? Drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. She will have been and will be a persecuting power against God's faithful people. By the way, did this happen with the Jewish nation as well? Do you know throughout history, the greatest enemies of God's people are God's people. <clears throat> you have this from the very beginning. Cain killed his own brother from his own household. Who killed the prophets in the Old Testament? The Egyptians? <laughs> no! Israel hated their own prophets. Who rose against Christ? The church! Who persecuted God's people during the 1260 years? The church! You think it's going to be any different at the end of time? No! When the church becomes allied with the political powers, it loses the reason for its existence. That's why as Adventists we should not get involved in criticizing any of the rulers. Now if they make decisions that are contrary to God's law, we have to stand for what is right. But we should not get involved in lobbying for certain political parties. Because both of them are going to end up in the same camp. What we need to do is show this that we're studying now. The Christian world needs to understand this. And unfortunately, in less and less of our pulpits, we're hearing, the, hearing this. We're hearing evangelical sermons. Nothing wrong with, with uh, you know, hearing a sermon that Jesus went to the cross and he died for us. And if we receive him as our Savior, you know, he, he considers us as if we had never sinned. That's beautiful. But that's not present truth. It's truth, but it's not present truth. Do you know Ellen White says that, there's, that uh, you know, there are many precious truths in the Word of God, but what the people need now is present truth. And do you know what the present truth is? The three angels' message. And the, what Jesus is doing in the sanctuary. You want to know what present truth is? All you have to do is look at what Jesus is doing and preach that. That's present truth. It doesn't eliminate all of the other truths. But all of the other truths at the end have to be clustered around the three angels' message. And the sanctuary message, particularly the time is coming when we're going to have the judgment of the living. We don't have a date. But when the loud cry is being proclaimed and thousands are leaving the churches and joining God's remnant, we'll know that we're in the time, close to the time, when the judgment of the living is going to take place. We can't place a date. The world needs to hear this, folks. You say, well, it's not kind to say that if you receive the mark of the beast, you know, you're going to be 
uh, you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. You know, that's not loving. So what is loving? Not telling people so that they end up in the lake of fire? <laughs> that's some kind of love, right? Oh, let's not, let's not ruffle people's feathers. You know, let's not offend anybody, you know, by telling them that they have to accept the message or else they're going to end up in the lake of fire if they receive the mark of the beast. Let's be kind now. Let's be merciful. Let's, let's not go there. And so they end up there. And who's to blame? We are because we had a false concept of what love is. Love tells the truth. You know, I tell my children, when my children were little, I said, listen, when you're going to cross the street, look right and look left. And then I made it very graphic. I said, if you don't, a car's going to come and smash you to the ground and you're going to be totally dismembered. Oh, how dare you offend the children? Why do you tell them that? Because you love them. You don't want it to happen. Are you with me? Now, we have just over a minute left here. Um, she also, this is also a political system because the harlot reigns over the kings of the earth. You can read that in Revelation 17, 18. She reigns over the kings of the earth. Not only does she rule the people, but she rules the kings as well. Now, final point in this session. Did you notice that in the second angel's message, it is repeated that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. What does that mean? Babylon is really fallen. Because in the Bible, when something is repeated, it, means it is given for emphasis sake. For example, God gave two dreams to Joseph so that they would know that it was absolutely sure. You can read this in Genesis. And the same gave Pharaoh two different dreams that meant the same thing because God wanted to make absolutely certain that people knew that this was going to be fulfilled. And so when the Bible says that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, it means that she is really fallen. By the way, Jesus uh, many times during his ministry said, Verily, verily, I say unto you. What did Je Why did Jesus say, verily, verily, I say unto you? He's saying, this is important, what I'm going to tell you now, by repeating the word, amen, amen, verily, verily. Well, our time is up. Uh, in our next lesson, we are going to study about the wine. The, the wine of wrath of the harlot. <laughs>